Hello and welcome to the Organic Gardening Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown and I'm joined by my colleagues Chris Collins and Anton Rosenfeld. Keen listeners may have noticed a difference in this month's episodes. We took a little summer break from our usual format and last week Anton started us off with a fascinating discussion on biocontrols and stimulants. He chatted with Julian Ives who founded the company Dragonfly. But don't worry if it all got a little technical for you, because in this episode, I wanted to bring their scientific expertise down to you and I, how us ordinary gardeners can use these products in our own organic patch. First, you'll hear a shorter version of Anton and Julian's conversation, just to bring you up to speed. Then, Chris joins us, about 20 minutes in, with his practical experience and questions. I found our discussion very helpful, navigating the way through the technicalities of such things as mycorrhizal fungi, rhizobium and nematodes. It does all sound very specialist, and like me, you might be daunted by these products. But I urge you to listen because I think that they are the future of growing and gardening research. It is, quite simply, nature's way of looking after plants. But before we dive in, I must first give a big thank you to our sponsors, the Organic Gardening Catalogue. They're proud to offer a complete range of organic gardening products, from seeds and plants to equipment. And as this month's episode is all about biocontrols, check out their catalogue online at organiccatalogue.com. And if you're a member of Garden Organic, you'll get 10% off. So it's over to you, Anton. Today, we're very lucky to have Julian Ives, the founder of Dragonfly, with us. Dragonfly make a range of ecological plant health products specifically aimed at gardeners. Perhaps not everybody knows what a biocontrol is. Um, I know they've been used for quite a long time, but perhaps could you explain what they are to our listeners? Yes, thanks, Anton. Thanks for inviting me onto, onto this podcast today. Yes, I mean, biological control, as, as a sort of simple definition, if you like, is, is the use of, of natural enemies or predators to control pests. So rather than using a chemical insecticide, you're in- introducing the natural enemy of that pest, whether it be a parasite, a predator, a microorganism like a fungi or a bacteria. So these are things that sort of happen in nature anyway, but we're giving them a bit of a helping hand, a bit of a boost. Are there any ones which you'd say have been the most popular with the gardeners? Which biocontrols do you think have really sold well? Uh, well, generally, again, nematodes, just because of the pests that we use them against, tend to be the more common ones. So most British gardeners will will have had or encountered slugs before, and that's one of the most common nematodes for use. Second to that might be vine weevil larvae. And again, we're using nematodes against vine weevils. So Having said that, on the predator side of things, the use of ladybirds is very, very popular now. I think partially because people just like the idea of ladybirds and it's a sort of very popular insect, but also they are very effective predators of aphids. And you can you can buy ladybirds in larvae form. So you might think, well, why would I put a ladybird in the garden? It's just going to fly off. But you can buy a larval form when they, when they haven't got any uh, wings at that stage. And that, that's quite a nice way of applying in a garden because you can... You can directly pour them out onto a, onto say a rose bush or something, and they will they will spend part at least part of their life cycle on that bush developing and feeding on the target pest before they develop into an adult. I'd never thought that the larvae couldn't fly, so that, that really does give them a good advantage, doesn't it? Because they will actually stay stay yeah. put. If if they fed in in that area already, you've got quite a high chance that even the adult will stay there at least at least until the pest supply is, is used up. I often think that perhaps ladybirds unfairly hog the limelight. I, th- I think perhaps we ought to perhaps give a bit more credence to things like the tiny parasitic wasps and things which do an amazing job as well. Do they yeah, oh, yes, popular? much indeed. I mean, you're quite right. Ladybirds get far too much of the press. There, there are many, many others. If you're growing a crop of, of tomatoes or cucumbers, e- even in a, in a small greenhouse, you're probably going to get whitefly at some stage. And we have very fit, efficient parasites of white fly, parasitic wasps, um, with something called Incarsia formosa, which is, which is probably the oldest biological control. Incarsia formosa was, was was used even before World War Two, so it's it's been around a very long time, and it's probably the sort of the classic biological control. Then you have other predators like the spider mite predator, Phytocelius, and and that was pretty much saved the cucumber industry in Holland, for instance. So they they'd got to a point where all the phytomites were resistant to insecticides 
that they were just putting in buckets of insecticide onto their cucumbers, no effect whatsoever. And then it was the founder of Coppet, Jan Coppet, came along with a predatory mite he'd found in Chile, introduced it onto the Dutch cucumber crops and pretty much single-handedly saved the, the cucumber industry. And, and that was probably the kickstart to sort of commercial use of, of, of biocontrol, certainly in Europe. That's a really great story that they this sort of single mite managed to save the cucumber industry. I think I really yeah. like that one. <laughs> so they've been used a lot by, by the industry. To what extent have they been taken up by gardeners? Well, I think the breakthrough has, has come through with the use of nematodes. Nematodes, uh, sort of microscopic eelworms, which we can water into the soil or grass to kill various pests. And they can be used indoors or outdoors they were limited in, in where you could get them um, because you've got you know, obvious storage issues with places like garden centres. How can they store a live insect? But now with, with the internet, you've, you've got a massive array of, of retailers where you can buy these type of products. And, and it, suits, it suits them very much because you, they're a live product and they can be dispatched quickly direct to the end users. How would I actually get them in the post? Uh, you would just go onto our website. We would have a, a section for pests and you would just type in vine weevil or slugs or whichever pest you were trying to control. And then you'd be given uh, you know, various options of different pack sizes of nematodes. It'll be picked and packed and, and literally sent in the post or by a courier. So it's, it's very swift, very swift. And when my nematodes arrive, I mean, what will I actually receive? Yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting question, because if you've never used them before, you sort of have perhaps a quite a strange vision of what a nematode might be, because... When you read the product description, you know, a lot of them will say contains 50 million nematodes and you think, gosh, that's going to be some huge sack of worms who's going to arrive. And you actually get a very, very small pack which contains millions and millions of nematodes. They're not visible to human eye or not very easily. And then you mix them up in water and then you water them on. I have tried it myself. I seem to remember it looking a bit like peanut butter and you had to really give it a good stir into the watering can. But yes, yes. Perhaps I had to bit of, have a bit of blind faith that it was going to work as well. <laughs> what would you say would be your sort of top tips for gardeners considering if, if they're going to use biocontrols? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a good question because the thing with biological control is it's, it's, it's not particularly cheap. It's, it can be quite expensive. And it's certainly expensive if you choose the wrong product. So the important thing is to identify the pest properly. So make sure that you know the pest you're, you're going to treat, um, because a lot of the products will be quite specific to particular pests. And then secondly, really, is you need to apply them at the right time, obviously, usually when the pest is there, but also more importantly, uh, at a time when the climate suits them. Because most of these insects or organisms need certain temperatures to, to be active. So... The nematodes, for instance, generally, they need a soil temperature of about 10 degrees and above. And another thing with, with the nematodes in particular is that they are UV sensitive. So the timing of the day when you apply can be quite important or the, or the type of day. So if it's a very bright, hot day, that's not good for nematode applications. In brighter conditions, really, you've got to, you've got to go early in the morning or, or, or sort of late in the evening to try and maximise the time when there's plenty of moisture around. But if you apply them on sort of a lunchtime on a bright day, you, you're not going to have a very good, uh, good result. I get the impression with biocontrols for gardeners, they're a little bit on the pricey side. So you want to make sure you get the right product for the right pest. But paying attention to the details of how you apply it is really, really crucial. No sort of slapdash applications. You really do need to read the label carefully. Yes. Shall we move on to biostimulants now? These are something that's just really quite different. And I don't think public are that aware of them. They've come to the fore quite a bit more recently. Could you perhaps outline what a biostimulant is? Yes, you're right. It's been around for a while. But they're coming more into public focus now. And um, basically, they are products which stimulate the plant's natural processes, if you like. So they, they stimulate the plant to do things in a more efficient way, um, whether that's uh, improving root growth or actually converting amino acids into proteins. But they're, they're basically stimulating the plant to be more efficient and they do that in a natural way they are normally plant-based there are some which are not but certainly the ones that we market are, are plant-based but they're, they're not a some people think they're a fertilizer some of them will have a fertilizer content um, but they're not a fertilizer they are aiding nutrition because if we get the plant 
acting in a more efficient way, then that helps it take up more nutrients. So it's all about making the plant processes better. Perhaps putting it very simply, it's almost like a boost to the immune system of plants, if plants have such a thing, which is quite a topical thing at the moment. It's almost like a vaccine for plants. It, it is. There, there is a similarity there, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it seems quite a change in mindset, really. Rather than trying to actually wipe out the pests, you're trying to strengthen the plants, which from an ecological point of view as well, that seems sort of vastly preferable. It, it makes the plant less attractive to pests. So if you've got plant acting in a, in a more efficient way, so uh, it's called, I think it's called passive immunity. When we're not combating the pest. There's nothing, there's nothing in the biostimulant which is going to kill that pest. It's really making the plant more resistant, like a vaccine, as you say, to, to pest attack. I mean, we might do some of these things anyway, just the way we treat our plants. For, for example, let's say if I was growing lettuces, I'd make sure that I'd hardened them off, left them outside for quite a while before I planted them in the soil. Because I know that if I just put things which have been growing in the greenhouse and it's all tender, then the slugs are far more likely to go for them. So perhaps it slightly replicates that process in a way. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you got any examples of perhaps some of the biostimulant products? Yes. I mean, I think the, the obvious one to mention is, is the mycorrhiza based ones. Which, which is a fungi-based bi- biostimulant, which, which most gardeners have heard of now. They've been used a lot, particularly with, with rose growing. Mycorrhiza as a fungi as a sort of symbiotic relationship with the plant. It's, it's um, helping the root plant take up n- nutrients and water more efficiently. A lot of our customers now buy mycorrhiza for a whole different range of plants because it, it is, particularly when you're planting out and you want the roots to be efficient early on to take up plenty of new nutrients and moisture, the mycorrhiza will, will benefit that. So, But there are, yeah, a whole plethora of other ones coming along behind. Certainly heard of mycorrhizae. Like you say, they are used a lot by when people are planting trees. I think I'd heard that they could extend the root system by something like 30 fold in some cases it really sort of has a massive boost to the plants are there any other sort of microbes yes there's something called trichoderma which is a a fungi you put in the soil and and that actually out competes other pathogens in the soil so it almost like fills the space where that pathogen should be it's all quite complicated as microbiology isn't it there's a lot that we still don't understand It's, it's it's so much more complicated than just using a pesticide to wipe something out because it's underground as well and you you can't see what's going on it's not like you're looking at the top of a plant and you're thinking well there's pest there and there's not pest there now um we can't really see what's happening in the soil it's it's not muck and magic but it is difficult is there a role adding them to more short livings like vegetables things which are annuals and not going to be in the soil for so long Uh, yes i certainly think with with certain vegetables and, and salads and things again it's all about getting that nutrition right if you can get the nutrition working more efficiently in the plant, um, you could actually boost the yields indirectly. So, uh, but also particularly, I think, propagation. So when you're when you're propagating your plants, uh, there's quite a few biostimulant products now which will certainly help you with getting those those fine white hairs going early on in the in the plant life cycle. So oh, that's interesting. So do you think that they play a role specifically for the organic gardener then? Uh, yes, the organic gardener is obviously has to think more closely about their choices. Um, that they they're not going to choose a synthetic fertilizer. Fertilizer. So they they want the plant to be uh, relying on its 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 own ability to take up water and nutrients. So a natural fungi, it's, it's naturally occurring mycorrhizae anyway. It's just we're putting it there in, in basically slightly higher numbers. All these mycorrhizae occur in the soil anyway. We will just add a little bit more in certain situations. So it it fits, I think, very well with with organic gardening. Yeah, I suppose because we always think about organic gardening as having a a sort of proactive approach to pest control, really. We're trying to prevent them happening in the first place rather than perhaps um, reaching for the bottle after everything's got out of hand. It's, it's, It's definitely a proactive approach. And I think that fits in very well to organic gardening systems. Perhaps people are not aware of how the nutrition can affect a plant's resilience to its pests and diseases. Have you got any examples of particular sort of nutrients that you might apply? A simple uh, nutrient like sulphur, for instance, and we have some sulphur-based biostimulants, will protect plants from, from outbreaks of powdery mildew. 
and then you've got a, a nutrient like calcium also which will which will help prevent other other diseases like bitter pit or blossom men rot <laughs> men rot thank you that's the other one i was thinking of but that that is fascinating really i mean i think organic growing is there's no one magic bullet as well we i don't know i think of sort of multiple ways of demoralizing our pests really that's a that's yes. a way to attack yeah. them yeah yeah I, th- I think with biostimulants, what we, what, why I'm particularly interested in them is, is, is that making the plant less attractive to pests. And then we, what we can do is then we can just spot treat with biological control when we need to. So, you know, for instance, if we got uh, an invasion of aphids later on, then we can bring in lace springs or ladybirds, whatever, and, and use that as a as a spot treatment. But if the plant itself is is healthier and it's deterring all this best before we get to that stage, then then, then it also makes the whole biological control um, area a little bit more cost-effective. You can just spend the money when you really need to spend it, rather than having to flood in high numbers of predators all the time to keep keep the plants clean. That sounds a good approach. I mean, it is a sort of multi-pronged approach as well. I, I, I think of it as a bit like a combination lock. If you're using a number of different things, and it's much less likely that the pest is going to get resistant or become wise to whatever you're doing and if you're just using let's say one agrochemical things things build up resistance to it quite quickly just Indeed. as you've seen yeah. with the cucumber growers so that multi-pronged approach i think is probably more sustainable in the in the long term where do you see but the sort of future for biostimulants i think you're going to see more of them i think you're going to see more widespread use of them uh, I also deal with professional growers and professional gardeners. So I'm, I'm visiting sort of large scale estates, places like Audley End and Hyde Hall and these sort of gardens. And, and I'm, when I'm talking to the gardeners there now, they're, they're getting very interested in the use of biostimulants and they're starting to use them. And then you get a sort of trickle down effect. So when, when the public goes to an RHS garden or a National Trust garden or an English Heritage garden, and they see the gardens they're using biostimulants, then they start to trickle into the into the wider marketplace. And, that, and that's what I'm starting to see with, with the biostimulants, just like I did with biocontrol 10, 20 years ago. So I think we're in quite an exciting place, really, with biostimulants. It's quite a dynamic future for them. Indeed, yes. It tends to be or has in the past been sort of a, focused on what's happening above the soil but now people are very interested in what's happening below the soil when i remember prince charles talking about these things many many years ago and he was dead right um he was just early about those ideas and and, and i think it's, it's a great thing it is a great thing it's always difficult to get people interested in what's below their feet isn't it it's just yeah, it's not yeah. visible to them well i think we'll leave it there i have to say thank you very much it's been absolutely fascinating we've packed full of interesting facts and i'm sure our listeners will be really interested what you have to say thank you very much many thanks Anton I've really enjoyed it thank you okay Chris so you and I have listened to this with great interest and what I'd like to know is when and where have you used biocontrols well Sarah I think it's quite a complex subject matter and so I'm very interested in the podcast because they uh, the chat seems to me have thrown up a load of ideas in my mind my biocontrol experience have always been in a commercial environment or a larger horticultural environment I've not really any found any use to use them on my balcony or on my allotment yet as a gardener as a as a commercial horticulturist we've done it on a huge scale so uh, for example when I worked at Edinburgh Botanic Gardens I don't want to get too technical here but we had a Gesneriaceae collection which is a South American plant quite endangered in places which got heavily infected by mealybug an absolute nightmare for an indoor glasshouse plant because not only do you get the mealybug you get the ants you get the sooty mold so this whole explosion happens and we used to use a ladybug called cryptolemus to bio control that but that relied on computer control systems it relied on the right temperature it relied on the right aeration the right humidity there's a whole game to it so i'm kind of interested on how you translate that to dougie morgan my friend who's pottering around in his back garden that's what i'm quite interested in is just how do we translate it into a setting that someone goes down the garden center and buys it no i take your point entirely because it sounded very professional and from what you've described within the glass house the controlled conditions and of course most of us don't have that at all anton what are your thoughts about that with biocontrols I think I'm in a similar boat to Chris, really. I've used them extensively at work at Wrighton Gardens. We Obviously, we have quite large glass houses for raising our, our plants. And under those sort of conditions, pests do often thrive because it's quite an artificial environment and, the, and it takes a while for the predators to occur 
naturally. So, but it takes quite a lot of planning as well. A lot of these things, you need to use them just as the pests are starting to build up. You, if you use them once the pests have got out of control, then they're not, they're not so effective. So, you know, you've got to be... You've got to know what you're doing, really. You've got to know you? what you're doing and you've got to plan in advance as well because obviously you order these things through the post so then that takes another sort of probably a week for them to arrive. For a gardener at home, it's quite a big outlay, really. You're generally going to spend about 10 quid. And, you know, I've sometimes considered using them at home. Like last year... Um, our aubergines just got completely riddled with red spider mite and we get it every year we got it on the melons a year before that as well mm. uh, and it's just got out of control before I've thought, thought about using them and thought well perhaps I you know I really should have ordered some some phytocelius against these red spider mites because it's a recurring problem and it always gets things so I, I need to be a bit ahead of the game really I mean, in truth them. our gardening is part of our daily life you know when, yeah. when you both have used them in your professional life so you're absolutely on the ball and it's your job to be so but most of us have just back gardens or allotments and what we do on them and how we treat them has to fit in with our going to work raising children cooking food whatever i think Anton might raise an important point there talking on the, about the melons and the aubergine where it, it's plant specific and you've invested in that crop and that crop is quite a lot of it maybe if it, you feel it's getting attacked but you've got to be invested in that plant you, that you want those aubergines you want those melons so there's a forward plan to it and the whole idea of having a healthy plant and a healthy soil to start with is square one isn't it that's kind of how i'd view it yes i agree chris and i think this is where i'm wondering from a practical point of view biosimulants and biocontrols they sound perfect for organic gardening actually if soil is healthy, you've got lots of biodiversity, you've got mixed planting. Do you actually need these biocontrols and these biostimulants? What are your thoughts there? I would say that they are useful for giving a, a helping hand in some circumstances. And they, sh they certainly shouldn't be thought of as a substitute for having a sort of healthy environment, a biodiverse environment, a healthy soil. I, I'd say something like some nematodes on vine weevil that can be used across the board. I'd say that's probably a worthwhile investment for a gardener. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it kind of doubles back to what I said earlier about the Gesneriaceae collection, where you have something valuable, it's important to you, you've invested time and effort. It becomes part, of, as a gardener, you know, it becomes part of your soul, doesn't it? My house plants are such a big part of me because I've had them for years. So then I think if I thought there was a big problem, I would definitely turn to biocontrol. Uh, before that, I, I would I will practice organic gardening and, and biostimulants as part of everyday organic practices. But I think con biocontrols have a massive role to play, maybe twofold. One is I would use them if I felt the need to and I wanted to protect important plants. But the other one, and this is maybe more important, and your interview touches on this, is the fact it's counteracting this let's reach for the poison attitude you know yes. it's kind of throwing a whole nother which is what we are here for this whole nother way of looking at how we garden how we consume and i think that's for those two reasons alone it that biocontrol is incredibly important but the danger is that they will turn into the equivalent of reaching for the red bottle on the shelf if you don't have the right conditions for them to work in. And by that, I don't just mean the, the right temperature and the right light levels, which Julian refers to. What I mean is if you don't garden organically in the first place and have mm. that biodiversity within your plot and have that healthy soil, then it, it's a bit of an empty gesture, isn't it? Yeah, you're right. It can't be like, oh, I won't use Roundup or use some Encarsia. It doesn't work that way, does it? It's your your interaction with your plot, with your balcony, with your garden that, that um, creates the conditions for use or not use. But I'm just glad that it's thrown up the discussion. I'm glad Julian's come along and done what he's doing. The skill levels and how we use them, that's all an education to be had. But it's a debate we weren't having 10, 15 years ago, even though we've been using these things since World War Two. The fact that it's out in the domain is quite an important step forward. I agree. What I'd like to do is, is hear your thoughts about biostimulants, because to me, I'm still struggling to differentiate between a biostimulant and a fertiliser. Anton, how would you define that difference? Or maybe there isn't a difference. I think sometimes the difference is slightly blurred. A fertiliser we often think of as providing all the sort of main building blocks, the sort of macronutrients, your N, P and K for your plants, sort of things that they're really going to suffer without. 
I'd say a biostimulant is a little bit more subtle. We could almost think of it as a, perhaps as a vitamin supplement for plants for providing those sort of s- smaller level micronutrients, which are essential for the health of the plant and for building up its strength and resilience. And there are also um, biostimulants which are providing microbes. For example, mycorrhizae is a really sort of common thing. With- okay, so I'm just going to stop you. Microbes and mycorrhizae, those sound very technical terms. Can you just explain them, unpack them a little bit more? Okay, well, I think it's, it's essential to realise that plants don't live alone. They have all sorts of helping hands and it's a very lonely life for a plant to just live on its own. It's really going to struggle. It needs all those microbes to help it out. So, for example, mycorrhizae are fungi which help to extend the root system. They help them to take up nutrients. Plant actually looks after the mycorrhizae and the mycorrhizae looks after the plant. They both look after each other. So the mycorrhizae help the plant to take up water and nutrients and the plant feeds the mycorrhizae with with sugars, basically. If you just provide the plant with a sort of junk food diet of chemical fertilizers, it just basically thinks, I don't, I don't need these fungi anymore. I'm not going to feed them. And the mycorrhizae just don't thrive in, anymore. So, so we need... That's fascinating. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant analogy. It really is. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you what, if you use the practical version of it, I was in um, the Mediterranean um, a couple of years ago before lockdown, obviously, and there were black pines, pine and snake, growing on lime rock faces. And the person who sat next to me said, how does that tree live on that rock? And the reason it can do that is the fungus on its roots fixes minerals from the rock in return for sugars. So if you interrupt that that process, exactly as Anton describes, the tree will then not rely on that, will not form that relationship. A good example of of artificial fertiliser is Osmocote in a bag of peat based compost because what you do is you whack your plant in it, the plant goes, Yeah, happy days. Six weeks later, that nutrient runs out, you've got no balanced feed to that soil or that plant. So, to establish those natural relationships should be our first port of call. Would that make sense to you, Anton? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think basically the simplest analogy is, is if you feed your kid junk food and then send it away from home and it hasn't learned how to cook, then it's, you know, it falls flat on yeah. its face. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a really nice thought. So a biostimulant would stimulate the plant. So the mycorrhizae, these little tiny root systems, are feeding the plant and supporting it and helping the plant get established. Exactly. And Anton, you've been trialling an interesting biostimulant which is something called frass insect frass yeah this this is really a sort of quite a new thing what it does is the frass contains chitin this is the stuff which is in the coatings of insect shells and by applying this to the soil what it does is it tricks the plant into thinking it's being attacked by an insect and then it builds up its resilience. So that really is like a vaccine in a way. You really are conditioning the plant so they're actually able to recognise when it's being attacked. It's just incredible, isn't it? What amazing thing nature is. Eh? It's, um, why would you gas it? It just doesn't make any sense when you've got all these tiny little miracles going on all over the place. Uh, but we do have that problem with how do we how do we take this incredible stuff and then sell it, basically, because we live in that kind of environment, don't we, for this to succeed? We need to be able to go to Joe Public for, I don't like that expression too much, but go to, you know, the people we know who we drink in the pub with and say, you should be getting involved in this. How how do we cross that bridge? Well, I think that is what exactly what Julian is trying to do through his professional skills. And he's moved from the the, the big commercial growers to the, the gardener. And I think what I take heart from is Whereas it used to be the fertilizer manufacturers had billions of money to research their chemical fertilizers. Now we have money going into things like discovering, as Anton described, how insects and the natural world can help us in terms of keeping a natural balance within the world. And that seems to me that lovely closed loop system that we're using nature to help nature. Yeah, it makes sense. So I'm bringing it back again to thinking about 
how we as gardeners can use them in our own plots. Now, Chris, you have clients who may well be listening to this podcast and they'll be coming to you on Monday morning and say, Chris, I'm really interested in those biostimulants. Should I be using them? I, well, in my own personal practices, the answer is obviously yes, but I tend to have used them over the years. I used to be in the arbor department at Kew. So planting a tree, bare root in the early, in the late autumn or early winter, we'd always use um, micro stimulants in the form of mycorrhizal association. We'd add that to the planting pit and hopefully you get a longer, stronger tree. That's the idea. You're investing in longevity and maybe something that's going to live three, 400 years and you want to give it that start. So I think that's been around. I've practiced that for a long time. What I'm interested in, and Julian touched on it well in the podcast, is how do you use it in a more immediate situation? How do you use it with, if I'm sowing, you know, some lettuces on the go, or I've got some strawberries on the go, how do you translate it into, or even bedding plants in my baskets? How do I translate it into that? Anton, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would certainly say you'd be using it for the sort of more established things. You'd certainly be adding mycorrhiza to those. I think adding them to vegetables, it's still a bit of an unknown (laughs) quantity, really. I I mean, one of the... unfortunate freaks of nature is that one of the group of plants that we use on a large scale the brassicas they don't actually form mycorrhizal associations so that's a little bit of an unfortunate quirk of nature and um, one of the things i have used well certainly at Wrighton, when we've been growing sort of legumes is adding rhizobium these are again it's a bit like the mycorrhiza these are the bacteria which fix the nitrogen they're fixing free fertilizer basically taking the nitrogen from the air where there's loads of nitrogen and turning it into a form that plants can can use but those bacteria are often not around so that I've often really, really seen the benefit. Where, where do you get that from? Where would I find such a thing, Anton? There are some plant catalogues which sell that. I mean, in, previously, it's been been a case of like you, you could only buy a sachet which would treat one hectare of a field, which is just <laughs> far more than you'd ever need. But they are selling them on the smaller scales for for gardeners. Rhizobium, isn't it? It's a natural occurrence, rhizobium in legumes, though, isn't it? Is it? disappearing because of our intensely using our plots or is it because we're using hybrids or what's causing it not to be a natural occurrence sometimes the bacteria are just not in this in the soil already so so you're supplementing it basically then that's what you're saying is that it, it is really but i mean for example if, if you plant broad beans the chances are that there will be the right bacteria around you nearly always see the nodules on the roots if you dig up some broad bean plants so probably no need to sort of supply any extras for those but something like runner beans often the right ones are not there in in the soil Um, runner beans or or french beans so so if you've always had problems growing french beans or runner beans maybe this is the clue to why that you you don't have the rhizobium which is a lovely word it sounds a little bit like ribena you don't have the rhizobium to support those beans that's really interesting. Chris, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say that's. Uh, it was just about soil health. You have rhizobium present. Obviously, when you come to the end of the season, you dig your legumes in. You're adding that that back to the soil. So you're, I, I would su- suggest you would create that rhizobium presence over the time because you're not removing the peas or the runner beans from that soil itself. A brilliant example of how efficient rhizobium are. Yesterday, I was in my local park. It's full of clover masses of it and it's alive with peas and beans but all that clover will be rhizobium present so if you wanted to say an area of garden that you think the soil spent is you would plant clover and legumes in there because it would have that rhizobium fixing nitrogen fixing ability very important part of the uh, of soil health is is the presence of rhizobium which ties into the no dig technique doesn't it yes Except that you you are in effect you're not pulling the plant out you're leaving the plant in but you have to turn it over into the soil so you can it's a little bit hazy as to whether that's digging or not well you're kind of like you can leave it on the top on leave i suppose but you are not interfering with that amazing ecosystem does that make sense to you anton yeah i mean it's been something that we've been doing for thousands of years until we invented nitrogen fertilizer <laughs> <It's brilliant. laughs> yeah so it's not new technology it's very interesting listening to julian because i think that um he's pioneering he's an entrepreneur obviously and he's we're going to need the julians of the world to bring this forward you know me and uh, anton can practice it we're gardeners that's what we do but you need those people who can look at the market and sell it and make it a reality of a day-to-day reality so god bless the breeds are off it really 
My thanks to Anton and Chris, and of course, Julie and Ives at Dragonfly. And if you want to know more about this world of bio products, I suggest you search online. There is a really good page on nematodes, for instance, on the Garden Organic website. Just go to gardenorganic.org.uk and search for nematodes. On a completely different subject, Chris will be a guest presenter at an event this month in Garden Organic's new demonstration garden. The topic is small spaces and container gardening, and it's on Saturday the 21st of August. You'll also get a free tour of the Wrighton Gardens, which are looking absolutely lovely at the moment. It's a hot ticket, so you need to book to reserve your space, check the Garden Organic website and search for events. Next month, we celebrate Organic September. I hope you can join us then. Press subscribe now and you'll never miss an episode. My thanks to the Organic Gardening Catalogue for their generous support and my thanks to you, as always, for listening. Bye for now. Thanks to Kevin McLeod for providing the music.